Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, are Apple's new MacBook Pros worth it? I have no idea, so Nick is going to explain it to me. Plus, your questions about recovering lost audio, organizing camera gear, and if your computer can handle 10-bit video files. Hello, Nick. Hello. Griffin Hammond, how are you? I'm good. Welcome back from your vacation. Thank you. Thank you. You had an excellent episode in my stead. I appreciate that. Yeah, if anyone missed last week, we had a special guest, Alex Ferrari. I, I want to say Ferrari because that's your wife's last name. <laughs> it's Ferrari. <laughs> like the car. Yeah, Alex Ferrari. His, uh, his podcast, Indie Film Hustle. I will actually be on his podcast later today after I record this. I'm going to record his podcast. Ooh, very exciting. Do we know when that's coming out, or is that still TBD? I don't know what his his publishing schedule is, but uh, definitely if you didn't hear last week's episode, you can go back and check it out to, to hear Alex. But certainly everyone heard last week's episode, right, everyone? Better. <laughs> Not too aggressive? Sorry. Yeah, actually, it was a great episode because he talked about the film that he is working on uh, that he shot at Sundance, so a very interesting technical episode about uh, what goes into shooting a film in four days and then editing it in six weeks that just sounds painful yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we got some new macbook pros kind of a surprise announcement from apple i'm yeah excited you, about it you sent this to me the same day that i was reading i mean i i pulled up some headlines i saw that it was happening uh and it sounded like it was a big step forward but I didn't really read deeply enough to or know. Or was it? Dun, yeah, dun, I, dun. <laughs> I think, you know, like always, people are mad that I think people feel like the MacBook Pros are getting away from the pro users by losing things like HDMI ports. It's all USB-C ports. There's no Thunderbolt. There's no SD card slot. Like all these things that the previous generation of MacBook Pros had that I liked. And then I got the most recent edition of the macbook pro before this latest upgrade and they had gotten rid of all those features it's a nice machine but it only has USB-C, and i think coming out with another generation of macbook pros again with just USB C, people are kind of upset that it's they're really doubling down on that so remind me what is your mac situation you have an imac and a macbook pro yeah i actually have two imacs i have like a I have like a 2017 iMac and I have like a 2012 iMac and I still have a couple MacBook Pros. I have a 2000 like 13 MacBook Pro and then I have the more recent like 2017 MacBook Pro. And do you are they the 13 inch or the 15 inch? They're both 15 inch. Okay. And why why do you have the old iMac and the old MacBook Pro? Do you still use them or just haven't gotten rid of them? Or what do you do with those? I just haven't gotten rid of them, and I still use them for a few things. Uh, in a way, it's it's laziness that I haven't like pulled all my files off of them, so they're really glorified hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still they're still drives. good machines. They still can handle. As you say, you can get some money for those usually. You know, if you don't wait ten years to sell them. Right. Yeah. If I don't wait too long. Yeah. I mean, if it weren't for the fact that I'm editing 4K video, these other machines that I have are, are perfectly capable of video editing. Gotcha. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, okay, so yes, you are right. The new MacBook Pros did not change the basic case in which the MacBook Pro lives, right. meaning it looks from the outside exactly the same. It still has the touch bar, which some people don't like. It's still only has USB-C ports, no other external ports, like you said, SD card or HDMI or USB-A um, yeah. ports, which are the, you know, kind of standard USB-A ports. Is that, a, I know a lot of people are upset about that. I've actually, so I have the 20, what, what is this, a 2017? Let me tell you. I yeah, mean, I you, have a 2017 13-inch MacBook Pro. Yeah. But I have. The I think that was the first bar version, version of those, right? Or was... yes, yes. The it one was. with the touch bar. You and I both have the first generation of that. Except I got the one without the touch bar. Oh, okay. So slightly different. So the MacBook Pro line looks like this: 13 inch without touch bar. Then there's the 13 inch with touch bar and the 15 inch with touch bar. 
Okay. Those are kind of the But yours things. is still all USB-C? Mine is all USB-C, but I only have two USB-C ports. Ooh. So the touch bar versions have four, two on each side, and I, going opting for the less expensive version, did not receive that. So yeah. two ports is tough. I'll tell you that. Two ports oh, yeah. is tough. Uh, I would definitely like a four port. So what Apple updated this year is just the touch bar versions. So they're still selling this 2017 okay. non-touch bar version, but it is not updated in the ways we're going to talk about. Um, but all the updates they did are on the inside. And for me, like I'm okay with the USB-C ports. I've made peace with the fact that I have to carry an HDMI adapter with me when I go out for work, and that's not a big deal. Yeah, me you, too. I, I mean, mean, it's frustrating for me. It to... I mean, go. I do so I do a lot of presentations with HDMI, so yeah, I carry around a dongle with me, and I'm fine with that. But it was the it was the the total of all of these things, the fact that I do use an SD card all the time and I do use HDMI all the time and I still have a bunch of Thunderbolt ports and I still have some some things that use USB-A so it was just kind of like wow you took away everything I do and so everything needs a dongle now but yeah I've gotten used to it and I I mean I think the thing I like about USB-C the most is that one it, it uses it for power and I have four ports they're on both sides so I can plug in the machine on either side which comes in handy especially when I'm yep really stretching the length of that cable unplugged in far away from an outlet. And a lot of my new devices use USB-C, like like the GH5 has USB-C. And so I can just unplug my power cable from the wall and plug it into my GH5. And one, that means I don't necessarily need an SD card reader because I can just use the camera as a reader. Right. But not ideal. If, you, if they're going to say, Nick, you get to pick one port to put back on the MacBook Pro, I'd probably pick SD card. Yeah, definitely. That would be the one I want back the most. I understand no USB-A. I kind of miss MagSafe, which was, you know, the power could pop out and not take your laptop with it when you tripped over it. But that's right. not a big deal for me, especially with how good the battery life is. I find it's either on my desk with a power cord going behind the desk where it's not a problem, or I'm just running on battery. So it hasn't yeah. been a big issue. The problem Let's for me is that my USB-C cable will come undone kind of easily. Like, it doesn't really snap in. It can just kind of slide out slowly. And so if I just happen to move my laptop around on the table a little bit, and I don't realize that it's kind of tugged on the power, it could You're just charging anymore. go like a millimeter and a half away, and it's not charging anymore. And so, so often, I've I've come back to my machine when it was trying to, like, upload overnight, and it's just, it's dead. Dead. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. I have not had that issue, so I'm not sure what your problem is. I think mine but, is probably uh, loosened over time because I will use a different port, or is it the cable? You think? Yeah, I don't know. Could be the port, could be the cable. Interesting. Well, that's a problem for another podcast, my friend. <laughs> so, all right, so we've aired all our grievances. <laughs> <laughs> we've aired our grievances. Those are the grievances they have not fixed, and that you know. Mostly, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Would I make a few changes? Yes. I understand, though, they're going for very thin, very light, very portable, and I do have mine in my backpack every day, all day, so it is nice that it is so light and portable. Again, I'm on a 13-inch. You're on a 15-inch. They're slightly different beasts. Um, I'm really excited about the 13-inch. So let me ask you this. You've always had 15-inch laptops. Why have you always gotten a 15-inch? Um, I mean, I think when they came out, it was a choice between the 15 and 17. I think I've even had a 17 before. Uh, so I think after starting with a 17 and moving down to a 15, I just, I think I've always had that feeling that like 15 was already kind of a compromise in screen size. Uh, but I do think it's a nice... So you like the big screen. Yeah, I like the big screen, but 15 also can fit in all my backpacks. So it's kind of like gotcha. the biggest I'm willing to go. See, for me, I've had both 15 and 13 inches before. I'm on the 13 inch now. In terms of portability, I love the 13 inch. It is so tiny and easy to take wherever I'm going. The problem has always been the 13 is a compromise in p performance, right? For real high-end yeah. video editing, the 15 inch is a much better machine for two big reasons. One, it has quad-core processors. Uh, as opposed to just dual core in a, the 13 inch, you couldn't get a quad core. And uh, two is dedicated graphics. So the 13 inch is always used just Intel's integrated graphics, not a dedicated yeah. graphics card. So half of that has gotten fixed in this new generation. So for the first time, 
ever for an Apple laptop, the 13 inch now is going to have a quad core processor. And that oh, okay. immediately, like, I want to upgrade for that reason and that reason alone. Although these are very expensive machines. I'm probably going to have to wait. Yeah. But, um, I mean, that's huge. And we've also upgraded from a max of 16 gigs of RAM to 32 gigs of RAM uh, on the 15 That's like the default? So, not the default, but the max. Oh, I see. Okay. It used to be when you go to a 15-inch laptop, the max was 16 gigs of RAM. And they have upgraded that to 32 which is very nice. Again, can't get yeah. that in the 13, only in the 15, but still very nice to have. So very excited yeah. about that. And then in the 15 inch, which has always been a quad core processor, it is now a six core processor. So we've gone from two to four on the 13 inch and from four to six on the 15 inch. And obviously increasing the core count is really a big deal for rendering video files and things like that are very parallel. So you're going to see significant improvements in performance on both the 13 and the 15. But the biggest jump is going to be on the 13 because we're doubling that processor count or that core count. Which are is you suggesting, simple. I don't know exactly how cores work and how that relates to rendering, but are you suggesting like if I go from four cores to six cores, does my render time drop by 33%? Like is it, is it? Yep. It, it's, a, I mean, of course there's some overhead, so it's not going to be quite that, but you can think of yeah. it linearly like that. Yes. Right cool um and now on the 15 inch you can also get up to four terabytes of ssd uh, yeah that's insane because in. i feel like <laughs> my my that last MacBook i'm glad pro, you agree <laughs> i think my first macbook pro had like 500 gigs and that might have even been me upgrading it at some point like actually going inside and installing a new hard drive myself so when i got the new macbook pro I felt like I was kind of splurging because I think maybe 512 was the standard and I upgraded to one terabyte. One terabyte. And I, I mean, and for I a think video I got solid it makes state. total sense. Yeah. Yep. But now you can do four terabyte. Did you say it was solid state? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All wow. SSD. They, what yeah, is they the don't standard? Sell spinning disc. I just so look. I just picked the, uh, so I'm looking at my Apple's page, the 15 inch MacBook Pro, they have two like default configurations. Yeah. Um, one of them is 256, the less expensive default config, and the more expensive default config is 512. Yeah. But, but then, yeah, it says it's configurable over, to one terabyte, two, or four terabyte SSD. But guess how much it costs to go from the 256 to the four terabyte SSD? How much extra? Um, I don't know. Is it like 2,000 more or something? It's $3,400 more. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, like a four terabyte drive, is that how much it costs? Thirty five hundred dollars? Is they're, that like w way overpriced? They're Apple? very expensive. I mean, of course, the Apple tax is on there as well, but they are very, very expensive to put that yeah. much SSD in that small of a space. Yes, jeez. And, you know, for my for my work, we sell a lot of SSDs, um, and four terabyte is a very common size these days, and they're very pricey. Although we now have sixteen terabyte SSDs that uh, that are really, really expensive if you really want to have your mind blown by the cost of a ssd yeah i mean for me one terabyte has been working pretty well i think 500 gigabytes was really limiting for me with video especially 4k video files and everything but i think most of my projects i think most of my shoots are probably around like 150 or 200 gigabytes so i might go and do one project that has three shoots and i might end up with like five or six hundred gigs so I definitely needed one terabyte, but I do feel like a one terabyte hard drive is able to handle all my apps and usually about two projects at once. But once I get onto a third project, it's like, okay, I got to clear something off this computer. So like four terabytes, I'd be able to handle a lot of things. <laughs> so in a perfect world for me, I just love the 13 inch. I think if I were doing video editing day in and day out, I would definitely get the 15 inch. I think that integrated or that dedicated graphics card is important. And they did upgrade those in the, in the new versions of the 15 inch. It's just, you know, the next in, uh, Radeon graphics card. Um, but for what I do where I'm only kind of dabbling in video editing. And so sometimes I need a lot of power, but I want that portability. This 13, new 13 inch just looks amazing. So I'm just, I'm pricing out like, if I were spending my own money, what would I buy? I'd probably get the base new model. I'd upgrade it to 16 gigs of RAM because it comes with eight by default. That's 200 bucks. And I'd probably, I did a minimum get the 512 SSD and I'd probably like to get the one terabyte. Yeah. Um, and that comes out to $2,599. 
that is a lot of money yeah. for a laptop. So they are very proud of these laptops. They are a little pricey, but I mean, I just think they're really cool. I'm very excited. It's still less than I spent. I, I'm sure mine was probably in like the 3200 range or something when I got the 15 inch. Oh, and we forgot the coolest thing. Um, they do you have an iPad right now? I do. Kind of an older one. Is it? A, but how old is it? I think I is it maybe it's the iPad Air two or something. I don't remember mm-hmm. the model. So you do not have a True Tone display then? I don't think so. No. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I mean, I, I th- I've seen that on a lot of newer Apple products. In fact, even my even my newest iMac is a different screen color than my last iMac. Right, but I don't think it has True Tone unless I'm crazy. Yeah. I don't know. It's bluer. My new one is bluer than my old one. True Tone has an ambient light sensor, and it adjusts the basically the white balance or the white level of the screen to match like the lighting in the room. Yeah, and it, that's that sounds crazy, but it, the effect is is amazing. It's really really good and really well done. And these now have them built into the laptops. It's the first time they've been built into the laptops. Oh, okay. So next time don't we're the, together, don't the iPhones me, do that too? I think the iPhone tens do it. I don't oh, know okay. that the iPhone eights do. Yeah. So I've got it on my iPad, my iPhone. I'd love to have it on my laptop, too. Um, yeah. So that's very cool. And then one other cool thing. <laughs> these SSGs they've put in here are crazy fast. Um, like even faster somebody, than the previous I, ones? Yes. Yeah. So I was just reading an article. It basically said, like, it was comparing the new MacBook Pros to some other, you know, comparably sized new laptops like the Dells and the HPs and stuff and like the average read and write speed on the SSD was like 400 megabytes a second Mm -hmm. and these things do 2,600 megabytes a second it they're just crazy fast so I I ran it on my current MacBook Pro I ran the Blackmagic disk speed test and I was getting 1,470 write speed and 566 read and now they've blown that up to like over 2,000 so yeah. Even against last year's Macs, they're way faster, which, again, is helpful when you're copying huge files and doing stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I suppose it won't be helpful for, like, copying from an SD card, but if you're copying between... Between high-speed things, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and your SSD will never be your bottleneck while you're rendering and stuff like that. Exactly, course. yeah. Not that it really was before, but... <clears throat> or as long as your your video card and your processor can handle decoding all these h264 streams your hard drive will have no problem uh giving you know playing back four streams at once or i don't know how many so in conclusion uh i would like you to buy me one of these laptops thank you (laughs) do you know like when they come out with a new like 15 inch for example is it priced the same as the old one was I think it start yeah I think it starts out at the same price let's look do you remember what you paid let's see 15 inch so definitely like buying a a MacBook Pro today is better than if you bought one like a month ago oh absolutely and if you're within 30 days usually they'll let you exchange yeah because otherwise you get kind of screwed <clears throat> uh, but I'm guessing it's not 2,399 does that sound about right yeah I'm guessing. Uh, I'm guessing, though, that there's no reason for me to upgrade. Uh, probably not yet. I mean, it, it, you can always upgrade, but I, I think the laptop you've got is going to last you a couple of years at least. Yeah. But I just maxed out the 15-inch with every available upgrade. So it has the highest Intel Core i9 six-core processor. It's got 32 gigs of RAM. It's got the 4 gig SSD or 4 terabyte SSD, $6,699. So, if you've got that line around, you might as well just, you know, buy a couple. Well, we should answer a question that we got from Blake, because it's about Macs and the specs you need to edit. And I don't know if you want to pull up, like, the specs for the 5K iMac. That's what he's asking about. He okay. wants to know, He's he's been editing with Windows uh, for a year, mm-hmm. and he's ready to switch back to Mac. I guess that's what he used to edit on. He's not been a fan of Windows. And so he's wondering if the base 5K iMac, he wants to upgrade the RAM separately, although I don't even know if you can. Uh, You can. Okay. I'm trying to think if I did that. Well, so I have the new iMac, and I don't think it's, it's not like 
I don't think there's like a port on the back you can open up and do it yourself anymore. No, I think you but gotta I was, take the screen off. Yeah, I took it to a store and they did it. It was like a, you know, maybe they charged a hundred dollars plus the RAM cost or something. But yeah, I had to have someone do that for me. But he's wondering, I, if the base... I would pay to have it done by Apple because then you know it's coming. You get a one speck of dust behind that glass and you ruin your five K screen. So. Go ahead, I'm well, sorry, I can't remember. I must have priced it out and thought like, oh, or no, I know what it was. I think Apple only had the base one in stock, and oh, I was in a rush mm-hmm. to finish a project. Right. So yeah, I was like, I'll take the one you have, and I think maybe even that same day I was able to take it over to this other third party and have them upgrade the RAM. Interesting. Okay. So assuming he'll get the up, the RAM upgraded, he's wondering if the base 5K iMac is good enough for editing 4K footage or if he should spend money to get the i7 processor. So the base in the current 27-inch uh, iMac with a Retina 5K display is a quad-core i5 with a max of 3.4 gigahertz. That, to me, sounds like absolutely plenty. Yes, I would not spend the money on upgrading the processor until I had upgraded my memory first and my SSD, uh, I think, are the two bang for your buck. And going from the default of 8 gigs to 16 gigs is only $200 from Apple. I think it's totally worth it to order it that way from Apple and not mess with third party because uh, that can be kind of a mess. Um, yeah. But that's up to you. I, I understand if you want to save 100 bucks, that's probably a way to do it. Um, but definitely get away from the Fusion Drive, which is where they take a very small SSD and pair it with a spinning hard drive. Um, and the small SSD is, you know, supposed to cache basically the spinning hard drive and make it feel like a full big SSD. But especially for video editing, you'll blow through that cache instantly and you are editing at hard drive speeds. So I would definitely, definitely, definitely upgrade to the full SSD and get as big as you can afford. That was the one mistake I made by buying the the one that was available. It was a Fusion Drive, and you at the time told me that that was a mistake. <laughs> mistakes were made. Mistakes were made, but that's okay. You know, but, have you noticed that that's a problem for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I do notice some lag every once in a while. So I I'm sure that was that's the issue. But otherwise, like this is a capable machine that handles all my 4K video editing. Although I do occasionally edit in proxy just to to help speed with that up. speed. I'm, that's your SSD or lack thereof. Yeah. And he uses, uh, Blake says that he uses Adobe uh, and that he knows we use Final Cut Pro 10. I suppose Final Cut Pro 10 could be a little bit more optimized for Macs, but you know, maybe it's a little bit speedier. I don't know. But uh, I would think it would handle Premiere just fine too. I would think so. Should we answer some questions? Yeah. And we have another one here from Gavin that's also a computer question. Um, But he starts by asking, well, really, if we back all the way up, this was Gavin sent me some troubleshooting for his GH5. He was having some trouble playing video files on his computer. And after we went back and forth and I asked him a lot of questions, I think my conclusion was that he was probably just shooting in 10-bit and the software he was using couldn't handle 10-bit color. And so okay. my advice to him was, well, either, you know, edit with Final Cut or Premiere, or DaVinci Resolve. I think those can all handle 10-bit color now as long as they're updated. But when they, when 10-bit first came out on the GH5, I think none of these applications could handle it. Um, so depending on what version you're using, it makes sense that your computer might not be able to do this. I think QuickTime can't play 10-bit. Hmm. Your, your camera doesn't shoot 10-bit, so really I don't think cool. you'd ever run into that. Uh, yeah, I don't run into this issue, so I'm not sure. But yeah, sometimes I'll shoot an interview in 10-bit if I know I'm going to have a colorist look at it. Uh, and so yeah, QuickTime doesn't handle it, but I, my editing software does. And I told him that I think VLC seems like it can always handle everything. Yep, they're you pro know? level, those guys. Yeah. The open source free video player. Yeah, because he was thinking maybe he had a problem with his camera. But I said... If you can play the files in VLC, also there's a piece of software called Edit Ready that I use, which if you had something that you can't play in your editing software or can't play in QuickTime or something like that, Edit Ready could transcode it. And Edit Ready seems to be able to handle all that stuff too. So as long as it can be read by one of those two applications, I think you're good. I'll put both of those in the show notes, by the way. 
But I would say if you're having that much trouble editing it, I mean, do you think 10 bits worth it? All the hassle? I mean, if, you're, if your workflow is not really set up for it, I would shoot in something that's going to make your life a little easier for editing. Well, yeah, I, I mean, here's his question. He's wondering if you can even tell the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit on YouTube or computer screens. I would guess in the final product, no, but you know, if you, like you said, if you're gonna be doing a ton of coloring or visual effects work, I think the extra, um, the, the extra information there helps you have a higher quality output. That was probably going to be 8-bit in the end. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, our screens, I mean, even on the new latest MacBooks, MacBook Pros, they're all 8-bit screens, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, you can't see the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit video when you're just playing it back or if you're going to upload it straight to YouTube. But yeah, if you're going to do some chroma keying or some some colorist stuff in, uh, you know, if you're going to color grade it in DaVinci Resolve, then you may want that extra color data to start with to reach a better end product. But no, if you're just shooting and then displaying, it, they look identical. So the rest of his question is, he would like to know what Mac we'd recommend for editing 4K 10-bit. Do you suppose the same Mac that Blake was asking about should work, the base 5K? I, absolutely, that would work. If you want a laptop, I think either of the new MacBook Pros would do it as well. Yeah. And again, yeah, I'm editing 4K 10-bit sometimes on this on this iMac, and it's fine. I don't know if I can stack a bunch of them. Stay away from the Fusion Drive. Stay away, stay away, stay away from the Fusion Drive. You don't want to be an like Griffin. (laughs) We got an Instagram message from Lisa who made a mistake that I have definitely made many times. She says that she's a beginner in filmmaking and was using an external microphone on her GH5. She noticed that after a while, she hadn't turned on the mic, but it was plugged into the body. You know where she's going with this. I know where she's going with this. Yeah. <laughs> Is it possible to get the sound back? So everyone at home, raise your hand if you've done this, because I think everybody's done this. Yes? <laughs> okay. Now that we've all had that moment. No, I think your sound is gone. It is uh, it is a terrible feeling in the pit of your stomach when you go in to edit a wedding or something, and you realize you have lost an entire audio track, and you go, what in the world do I do? You've been there. Yes, Griffin? Yeah, yeah, it's the worst thing because the cameras that we use do have their own microphones and they can record that sound that's pretty usable. But if you happen to put a better mic on and plugged it in, but the mic wasn't working, or worse, like I've had mics that like one of one of those Rode like Go mics or something, it plugs in in two places. The the mic jack goes into the camera and then the other side of the jack goes into the microphone, and so. You might be perfectly plugged into the camera, but if it comes a little loose from the microphone itself, then you don't have a signal at all. Yep. And yeah, when you plug into the camera, you're overriding. The camera can only record one or the other, so it's choosing to record the nothing that's coming in. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's no fun. Hopefully you have other audio sources. I've definitely had to complete a mix minus an audio track I thought I was going to have. Um, Usually, if you've got multiple cameras and multiple mics, you've you've got some other options. If it's your only audio, well, time to put in some pretty music because there's well, yeah, no net sound. I started asking Lisa what kind of things she shot because my fear was, oh, man, if she shot like an interview, like a 45-minute interview or something, I mean, there's nothing you can do. You just got to go shoot that again. But I thought, well, maybe if she did like a fiction film, she could do ADR. She could go back and have her actors re-record the piece maybe there's something else she could yeah. she could do and it turns out she was actually shooting like b-roll for a documentary uh so it was like it was like a family playing in a pool and i thought like well that kind of sucks but like you could go get some sound effects probably you could go find some like pool ambiance and maybe <laughs> exactly. you could get some splashing sounds and kind of fill it in so people don't really think about the fact that the audience the audio is missing this is why we always monitor our audio. That's advice I often fail to take myself, but you should always check your audio before yeah, or even especially during recording. Well, the camera will give you will at least give you bouncing audio meters. Right. So, 
you at least should be able to identify when you're not getting any sound. That's definitely a problem. But even when you see the bouncing meters, you still want to be monitoring because so often you're getting wind noise that makes the whole thing unusable. Or you might have a mic that's slightly plugged in and it's getting a signal, but when you listen to it, it's all staticky. Uh, so you need to be able to troubleshoot that stuff. Yes, indeedy. We got a YouTube comment from Roman uh, who says, Nick, I actually grew up in Las Vegas, which is where I am. So awesome. Go Golden Knights. <laughs> Question, do you ever record audio using the stereo mics on the GH5 and use it? I shoot weddings frequently and find that I like how it sounds, especially during the reception, to hear the crowd reaction. Griffin? Yeah. Do you ever use the built-in mics on your B cams or somewhere you don't have a, a high-end mic plugged in? Oh, yeah. It's almost like I put this question right after the last one because they're related. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Um, Did I ruin yeah. some beautiful segue you had planned? Yeah, no, no, there was no segue. I just thought they okay. should be together. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But yeah, I would I think, do this all uh, the time when I shot weddings. I yes, uh, constantly. Right. Often I would, you know, maybe fade in that audio track when I wanted to hear that crowd reaction and then bring it down to focus on a speaker or something like that. But um, definitely was part of my mix. A lot of times, what I'll do, and I definitely did this at weddings, and I do it now in news, is I'll be in the crowd watching someone's speech i'll be handheld getting a close-up or something of a politician and so i'm getting the mic audio right in the camera but i know that's not the good audio that i'm going to use i've plugged into the malt box in the back of the room the box that they put at news events for the the person at the at the lectern their audio is going to the malt box so everyone can get the good audio but when I just play that, it usually sounds so clean that you don't really get a sense of the environment. So I'll often mix in a little bit of my mic, and now you hear a little bit of the reverb of the room, and you, it just feels like, oh, they're giving a speech in a big room with the din of people in the background. So yeah, I, I like having some of that natural sound as well. I think you should always get multiple sources of audio in that kind of environment, because you may have something fail at some point. Like Lisa. Sorry, Lisa. Have you ever had, like thinking of like news events and weddings, have you ever had the good audio from the board that like you were like, this is, this is going to be perfect. It's going to be the best way to hear the speeches or something. And then when you get it, you realize the DJ was sending all of it out too hot. And it's just like yes. unusable. So when I was doing weddings, I fairly quickly decided I was never going to take a random wedding DJ's output because I just didn't trust it. Right. So I would put a mic in front of their speaker and it actually sounded great and I knew if I could hear it in the room, that's what I was getting recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was watching like a news conference last week. I think it was when uh, Rosenstein was talking about indicting the 12 Russians and I turned on I think it was like PBS or something online. I think I was just watching their Twitter live stream. And he was too hot. So he was peaking every word and it was driving me insane. <laughs> and so I just flipped over to like CNN's website or something and they were playing the same thing, but they had better audio. It's like they're all getting the same feed, but someone had turned their mixer up too much. And I just thought like, it's just driving me crazy. I can't listen to it that way. <laughs> We got an email from Bill who says, a big fan here. Wait each week for a new podcast episode. Thanks, Bill. Thank I finally you. watched Sriracha and loved it as well as learned from it. What lenses did you use to film Sriracha? Nick, you know what lenses I used because you were shooting some I of it. I helped shot it. Uh, uh, shoot it. Uh, help 18 shot. 35. I helped shot it. No, uh, that's right? not the lens. No. Dang. You're thinking of it's, 18 to 35 is the Sigma art lens that everyone loves. Oh, the 12 to 35. 12 to 35. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry was the was the main lens and you had some prime i forget which one you were using yeah the 12 to 35 was pretty much it although i did use uh a 30 millimeter i had a sigma 30 millimeter prime that i used a couple times for some really dark situations but that was really it and then i used a gopro sometimes but most of that film was the 12 to 35 that was for like the on the conveyor belt stuff and things like that. Yeah. 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 So here's an Instagram message that I got from Anthony. And this is actually something I've been thinking about recently. 
he's wondering how we organize our camera gear. He says that he has boxes of lenses in shrink wrap. And he says that I don't seem like the type of person that would find that satisfactory. <laughs> what about you? Well, I'm trying to understand what that means. Boxes of lenses in shrink wrap. I'm wondering if he just has like a big cardboard box. He wraps his lenses in shrink wrap. Or does he mean bubble wrap? Maybe he wrap? means bubble wrap, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, okay. That might make more sense. I was like, shrink wrap is like what you put over like a box in a store, like this. Right. Okay. <laughs> or maybe he just um, has a bunch of loose shrink wrap as padding. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Uh I I don't organize my camera gear very well. I have a nice camera bag. That's actually right here. That has a bunch of loose crap in it. Um, there's like here's a lens just kind of floating around. At least it's got a lens. Well, yeah, I was gonna on. say you don't have too much gear, so you may just be able to keep it all in a bag, right? Yeah, I have a lot of it in this bag, but the stuff I use a lot, like I don't know, is it in the shot? You can see some lenses up on the shelf here. Like all my camera gear kind of goes up there when I'm when I'm done with the podcast for the week. Yeah. So I kind of spread it around a little bit. I mean, I have a few camera you. you're, bags. You're kind of a hodgepodge of a mess, too. You have yeah. lenses all over your desk and stuff. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. I mean, a lot of times it's a, a lot of it's in one of my bags because that's how it travels to shoots. And so it kind of seems mm -hmm. silly to always be taking it out of the bag. Um, but I do have a dresser with, with a bunch of lenses and cameras. In fact, let me grab... Yeah. I have... I bought these little... I don't know what they're called. These little like organizers for dressers. They're not super padded. So like, I mean, I'm sure some people like to keep their lenses and cameras in like Pelican cases with custom cut foam and keep it really protected. Um, but I figure if mine's in a drawer, it's not like it's getting banged around in there. I got these little dresser drawer organizers. I think they're just designed for like underwear and socks. Oh, I see. So it's like a it drops in and gives you like lots of little compartments in a drawer. Yeah, it's just like a bunch of little squares, and and it's cool because they can ship these things flat. They can fold up in a way. It's like until you slide the yeah, bottom like, in, uh. it just it all collapses. Uh, so it's a really lightweight thing, but it's pretty perfect for lenses. And then I also have some camera bodies stuck in a different one. So I'll put a link. It, in the show notes at Hate Film to the exact thing that I use, but it's a really just a little cheap drawer organizer. But I still feel like I need a better system. Because I do we got have a YouTube kind of comment everywhere. in similar vein from Joseph Mikulik. Did I say that right? Mikulik. Sounds good. Yeah, Mikulik, maybe. Hi, Joseph. Uh, anyone have any recommendation for a camera bag that can also fit a laptop? I feel like we've talked about this before. Yeah. In fact, if you want a really full conversation about camera bags and traveling, Nick and I just talked about that on two episodes ago, on episode 69. But your Peak Design bag fits a laptop, right? It does. So I have the Peak Design Everyday Backpack 20 liter version, which is the smaller version. Um, it will fit my 13-inch MacBook Pro perfectly. I have read that the 15-inch fits, but very tightly. So it's got a pocket in the back for uh, laptop and iPad, a little pouch up here for extras, and then the main compartment has all these adjustable dividers and things like that for your, all your camera gear. So I like yeah. that. And does, is that a dedicated slot for a laptop? Correct. Yeah. And my... Uh, P or was what's mine called? The Think Tank Think Perception Tank Pro. Pro. Yeah. Oh, that's close. The Think Tank Perception Pro has a has a dedicated slot for a laptop as well, and it works for me and my 15 inch. Uh, but even my 15 inch will fit inside my my Low Pro Photo Hatchback 16L. So even a small bag like that, which we talked about a couple episodes ago, I'll put that in the show notes. That can fit a laptop as well beautiful our final question today is an email from justin i feel like we should always end the ep end the episode on a legal question that we can't answer <laughs> definitively perfect love it 
This question from Justin is, he's filming a social experiment documentary. I don't know exactly what that means, but he is going to be following his subject 24-7. I also wonder if he's really following <laughs> all 24 it's hours of the day. sleep at some point, but okay. yeah, maybe, maybe that's the point. Team. Crack team. Uh, so this is a person going about their everyday life, being followed 24-7 by camera. He's unsure about what do you do with location release forms? Like, how do you get permission when you're following someone just through their regular life and not interrupting the shooting? Mm, good question. I would probably just ignore it till it became a problem, but that's probably not the best plan. <laughs> I mean, yeah, depending on the nature of your film and what kinds of things you're shooting and how, you know, if, if you're really obvious while you're shooting and people people get frustrated that you're there that could cause a problem but i don't know if you are really low-key you might get away with it <laughs> but uh if you really want to be safe yeah you probably should get loca location release forms i wonder if you could somehow like does this have to be completely impromptu or could you ask your subject what their plan is for the day and have a producer go get release forms from some of these locations i don't know exactly the nature of this film you're making hard to say good luck but depending on the way you film it like i mean if you were filming it with a really shallow lens and everything in the background's out of focus and it's always close-ups of the person you're following would we even know where they are and could anyone have a problem with that i don't know i feel like that was the least definitive legal question we've ever answered <laughs> which is probably for the best since right. we are not lawyers <laughs> i prefer being non-definitive well uh, undefinitive what would the what would the word there be i don't know i part? like non-definitive <laughs> uh good hey bonus question for griffin hammond you ready oh, for this no. no i'm not have you <laughs> okay i'm just have you seen this uncharted fan film starring nathan fillion i watched like about two minutes of it when you shared it with me well i was i didn't really share it it was one of our uh, respective friends so i've only watched a part of it too what i'm so you don't know what the deal is like how is this a fan film that isn't related to the actual video game and how is nathan fillion in it and it's, it's, very, <laughs> well, yeah, the, it's very confusing the, to me but i started watching me. it it looks like it's really well done but it's like it's not done with the permission of the rights holder but it's like done professionally <laughs> yeah it's one of those like fan films that even starts with the the disclaimer you know we have nothing to do with the the intellectual property you know don't sue us we're not monetizing this that kind of thing and so when i saw in the title of the video on youtube and we should put this in the show notes at hey.film i saw in the title that nathan fillion's name was there the actor that is probably best known from firefly right yeah and castle and other things yeah so I thought, well, surely Nathan Fillion's not really in it. This is like some. That's re exactly what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. I thought they were going to take he, he like things the... that he was already in and edit it in with some footage from the game or something. Or a guy who looks like Nathan Fillion. Like people saying, "Wouldn't it be great if Nathan Fillion was in it? Here's what it could look like." like right. There's even I, a reveal. I, and then I start watching it. Yeah. It's like, oh my they god. Like, they lift. <laughs> it's really Nathan you know, they, Fillion. They like uncover his face, and then it's definitely Nathan Fillion. And for even for like 30 seconds, I was thinking. Well, how did they do this CGI where they mapped Nathan Fillion's <laughs> face onto some guy? I'm glad we had the same thoughts because this doesn't, that's what, like the whole thing doesn't make sense to me. That's why I'm trying to get my, my head around who made this and what is its real, or is this all just like a marketing thing and it really is, you know, like a real movie that's going to come out? I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Or maybe it's just marketing for the, the game series. But I actually kind of read it as, like, now that I know it's really Nathan Fillion. So Nathan Fillion, he's an executive producer on it. He must, one, either love this game series and just thought, like, me and my friends, it'd be really fun to make a mini movie about it. Or two, he has seen all these people online who really want him to be in a movie about it. He thinks that's a great idea. He would love to be in a movie about it and thought, essentially, like an actor might do, I mean, I say that like he's not an actor. Like but I mean, a like a lot of, job. <laughs> yeah, a lot of like indie actors will just like make a film that's kind of like the thing they would want to make. 
uh, he's just saying, look, I could play this character. Don't you think this is cool? And he now he can show this to people and say, why don't we make this movie? That's funny. All right, well, maybe we'll know, know more by next week as to what the real purpose behind this was, but I just found it kind of fascinating and different. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Although I didn't find it fascinating enough to watch the whole thing. <laughs> Probably because I haven't played the game, so I wasn't totally into it. Yeah. All righty. Well, we good? Yeah. We're we good. Wrap it up. <laughs> Wrap it up. I'll talk to Do you next week. Do we have a podcast next week? Yes, it's not a break or anything. Yeah, next week we'll have a regularly scheduled episode, and then the week after that will be a bonus episode where we take the week off. Bonus. And then, no, not yet. I was going to say, there might be a chance for us to film another podcast together, but uh, that's actually still a little ways off. Yeah. So we won't talk about that secret yet. If you've listened this long, though, you got a little... We'll taste the secret nugget. that we might record a podcast together again. <laughs> okay, just go with me here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Griffin. We will talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Bye-bye. We'll see you. Bye. It's really hot in this we, room, and I'm very sweaty Oh, now. me too. I'm, I'm dying. <laughs> I have, like... I have a nice like button up shirt on and so I'm in pants on it's way too hot. It is currently ninety five degrees and it's gonna be like hundred and five today. Too hot. Yeah. I think it's like ninety and humid here today. Ooh.